Welcome to the High Income Business Writing Podcast, helping you propel your writing business to a whole new level. And now, here's your host, Ed Gandia. Hey there, welcome to the High Income Business Writing Podcast. I am your host, Ed Gandia, and this is the podcast for business writers and copywriters who want to earn more and less time doing work they love for better clients. You can find detailed show notes for this episode at b2blauncher.com forward slash episode 225. Those notes include a summary of our discussion as well as links to resources we mention during the show. Pricing is one of the most important levers in our freelance business. Many of my coaching clients have transformed their writing businesses and their income in a matter of weeks or months simply by changing the way they price their work. Making the right changes almost always has a domino effect. Higher fees translates into higher income, which boosts your confidence, which helps you better see your value, which translates into being bolder with how you price your work, which leads to better results. And so the cycle goes. Today, I'm joined by Mike McDermott. Mike is the co-founder and CEO of FreshBooks, which is the number two small business accounting software in America. I wanted to bring Mike to the show because he used to be one of us. Before starting FreshBooks, he did freelance work, and pricing is a topic he's very passionate about. His ideas on the subject align very well with mine, and his message and his advice is one we all need to hear, especially during this difficult time in the world. My hope is that this conversation sparks something in you and that you use that spark to start moving in a better direction with your pricing. As Mike says in the interview, sometimes, especially right now, you have to do things to keep the lights on, okay? So that's fine. But the key is not to get everything perfect. The key is to start moving in the right direction, no matter what's going on in the world. One last quick thing, I highly encourage you to download Mike's free PDF ebook. You'll find it, it's free, just Google it. We'll have links for it here in the show notes, and I think it's going to just start opening up your mind to the possibilities and how to shift the way you think about pricing. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Mike McDermott. Mike, welcome. Great to have you here at the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. Good to reconnect after all these years. It has been great all these years, and it feels like it's just yesterday, but you and I first connected about 10 years ago in our first International Freelancers Day online conference before online summits were a thing. And man, after all these years, we get to talk again. So it's, it's awesome. Yeah. I'd like to start with the FreshBooks story just because I love how you got started. I love the story behind it. I love just kind of the grit and resourcefulness of you and your team. So maybe you know, walk us back to how this company got founded. No, that's great. You know, I can do the story, a 90 minute version, you know, sort of five minute version, a, uh, you know, a 10 second version. I think for the purposes of, you know, this call, I'm going to go, you know, probably closer to the five minute version. I'll keep it a little shorter than that. But I think it'll set the table and hopefully give people, you know, some perspective on, you know, where I'm coming from and also open the door to a whole bunch of things we can talk about. So let's go there. So, you know, before FreshBooks, there was Mike. (laughs) Mike is me. And what I was doing was I started building websites for myself. I had been running an annual event and I taught myself how to build websites. And I used that website to market my event and get people to come out and provide information for them. You know, funnily enough, my caterer needed a website for that event. So I started building websites for other people. And, you know, I quickly realized what's the point of having a website unless people show up. And so I got into internet marketing. And then, you know, I started to realize, like, you can use internet marketing to attract a whole bunch of traffic. But if you don't attract the right traffic, then, you know, what's the point? So I started working on, well, how do I get targeted traffic? And then the third stage in my, you know, sort of thought process was, geez, you know, I've got the right traffic now. But, you know, what really matters is not that I get the volume of traffic or that I get the right traffic. It's that, you know, I persuade people to purchase and take an action and do the thing that we set out to do. And Mm -hmm. I got into this called conversion consulting. And it was a mix of, you know, a bunch of disciplines. 
And I was kind of a student of the folks of Future Now, Inc. They were my inspiration in a bunch of ways. The Eisenbergs, people know them. Oh, yeah. But the point is a bunch of good sort of science and art. And, you know, I found like sort of great results for clients with all this stuff. And, you know, what I'll go ahead and say is, because I know you've got lots of copywriters and things like that, like the hero of this stuff is copy, right? And sort of persuasive copywriting. There's a lot of design elements. There's a lot of other considerations. There's math. You know, the hero is really, you know, copy and content. So that was uh, this, I built up this consultancy doing these kinds of things. And I was building my clients with Word and Excel. And I built up, you know, a team of people I worked with, a lot of them sort of, you know, contract and part-time, but mostly, you know, increasingly like just dedicated to me. So we had about four people going away, working on things for clients. And then um, I accidentally saved over an invoice. I was using Word and Excel to build my clients. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of people do, if you're using Google Docs, you're using Word and Excel, you're just doing it wrong. There's no excuse for it, uh, full stop go ahead and you know you need to switch to fresh books and we'll talk about that in a second but i was using word and excel saved over an invoice so there's got to be a better way and so along with building this conversion uh, consulting practice up and helping people build websites you know i'd started to getting into programming and so i built a simple thing to build my clients and then you know i really built it for myself and then realized other people would like it so that was kind of like the spark if you will so the background and then the spark and then you know, what became interesting to me is I'd progressed my practice in those three sort of iterations and this whole building a product thing became very exciting. So I started focusing most of my energy, like 80% of my time on that and moved into my parents' basement for three and a half years. You know, after two years, we had 10 people paying us about nine ninety five each. So we were making a hundred dollars a month. My co-founder being a doctorate in computer science and electrical engineer, the three of us. So like pretty, you know, I don't know, a uh, competent group. We're making a hundred bucks a month after like two years of our lives. Not very good, but uh, hunkered <laughs> down in my parents' basement. And, you know, that was kind of, you know, the sort of end of the, the beginning. And, you know, since then, we're, we're about 400 people today. We have paying customers in over a hundred countries, uh, over 20 million people use the software. We're sort of number two in America for small business accounting software. And the thing that makes us different is that we don't serve restaurants, we don't serve retail, we just serve service-based businesses who get paid for their time and expertise. So I'm still kind of solving the problems that I had back when I was that copywriting, you know, consulting and design agency back in the day. Uh, there's just a ton of work for us to do. We love what we're doing. And again, if you're using Word and Excel to do things, you're doing it wrong. Please, please go ahead and check out Fresh Books and get started for free if you like. Anyways, that's the, I didn't mean to turn that into an ad, but you know, I think there's a, a pl- <laughs> place for it in that, that arc of the, the story. Absolutely. We're going to come back to that because we're going to be talking about pricing. I love this kinds of stories because I think that's the way most of life unfolds, right? It's you go after something in the pursuit of that thing, you find this other path and that new path becomes your thing. You would have never discovered that path had you not gone after the first thing, right? So there's a book called Obliquity, which is all about that. And I think that's, well, it's obvious that that's what happened to you and to FreshBooks. Uh, So let's pivot a little bit and talk about uh, pricing. This is a very hot topic. It's a topic that's filled with emotion you know, among freelancers. And I'm curious, you feel very passionate about this. Why do you feel creative professionals should charge for the value of the services they deliver as opposed to uh, time and, and other factors? Yeah. Good. Well, let's go there. So one of the things over the years at FreshBooks since we got going was, you know, we do these things called customer dinners. And I, I go, <laughs> harder to do in a COVID world, but we go and sit down with customers and uh, literally we take them out to dinner. No agenda. Wanted them mostly to meet each other. But I, you know, the questions I would get at those dinners, a lot of them, yeah, the product, but then you start to listen and it's like, you know, this topic of pricing comes up again and again. And so again, just for background and context, one of the things I did, you know, as we grew FreshBooks up, and it's probably around 2010 or you know, 2013 or 14, something like that, I wrote a book called Breaking the Time Barrier, which is really a book about how to price your services and shift from hourly and things like that to value-based. You know, I'll just put a little plug in for it and then I'll go ahead and answer the question. But Please I think do, it, yeah. again, speaks to context. So the book is, it'll take you about 45 minutes to read. It's free. You can get it online. Just go search Breaking the Time Barrier, Fresh Books. It's written like a fable, so full disclosure there. But I think the purpose of the book is actually to help people transition from whatever pricing scheme they have today to value-based, okay? So it's to help you take you through the mental hurdles that are probably holding you back and help you see, you know, the dynamics of the how and the why of getting the value-based. And so 
I encourage you to go ahead and read it. If it's not worth your 45 minutes, as I like to say, shame on me. We've had people, we made it free and said, you know, donate what you think it's worth. And people donated like tens of thousands of dollars, which was great because, you know, they found value in it. So in some cases, some people like lawyers, hundreds of dollars, like thanks for those books. So go check it out. With that as a backdrop, you know, this is a topic I care a lot about. And so like the question being, you know, why or should they charge for value? I think, you know, the way I like to come at that is let's talk about what's wrong with charging by the hour. And there are a bunch of things. Let's start with, first of all, charge by the hour. There's a presumption that every hour is created equal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the fact is, you know, creative work, and I think that's knowledge work is fundamentally creative work, in my opinion, It's sort of productivity is nonlinear. It's not consistent. You know, some get more done in an hour than I get in three weeks. Other times I spend a whole day and I feel like I kind of get nothing of use done. And so this notion that every hour is sort of created equal and you should build that way you know, is flawed because not all hours are, you know, are the same. That's one reason. There are a whole bunch of reasons that kind of get debunked in the book. But my favorite one for why to not use time is actually comes down to customers. And I just believe in alignment, shared values. And to me in business and in life to be successful, you need shared values and alignment. And when you charge by the hour, you are fundamentally pitting yourself against your client. And let me talk about what I mean by that. You know, your client has an incentive to have you work less hours so things are cheaper. Mm -hmm. You have incentive to work more hours so you make more money. Like that is a very broken thing. So amongst other things, you know, what value-based pricing does is it kind of shifts the narrative from, you know, like also here's another reason why to get away from, from hours. It's, you know, there's just unpredictability and you can show up at the end with a big bill and your clients are like surprised by it. So you know, in a world where you shift to value-based, you go ahead and you try and uncover like what the goals of the client are, you know, you help, you know, align on what the impact is if we do the project right. And then we price the project as a percentage of that kind of upside, right? That's kind of a simplistic way to think about it. Mm -hmm. And what you get out of that is alignment with your client. And I think that's a big thing. So those are a bunch of reasons why I don't like charging by the hour. And then uh, that's a quick primer on value-based pricing and the sort of mind shift and you know, orientation shift uh, for with your client. Let's talk a little bit about that. I couldn't agree more. This is definitely a mindset shift. It's taken me a long time to get there. And I feel like I'll never quite arrive. But one of the concerns that a lot of writers have is, okay, I get that conceptually. I understand it intellectually. Perfect. How do you determine value when what I do is doesn't create an immediate result in terms of sales or profit? How do I measure value? How do I talk about the value? Well, you know, so I say that starts in a different place. Like you have a different problem that you probably want to start working on sooner, which is, yeah, how do I go ahead and understand my value, you know, relative to the needs of, you know, maybe my clients or what have you and those kinds of things. So I mean, I think at the heart of this approach to value-based pricing is, you know, a mindset shift towards thinking more like a consultant, if you will. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you work with a consultant, what they do, do a bunch of work up front to understand needs and draw that out. So, you know, when I started out as like a web designer, I was like brochureware. Hey, I can build you a website. It's going to cost you X. Mm -hmm. Okay. When I finished doing that work, I would spend a lot of time that note I was not getting paid for, okay, because I hadn't got the client yet, sitting down and understanding the goals of the client. Mm -hmm. You know, I literally start with like the history. Tell me how the company was founded. I need to understand you. And people might say, oh, that's a long arc. I don't want to spend time with my copywriter on that. I would say, start there, right? And then get into like, what are the problems of today? Why are you trying to get me doing this? And, you know, what are the objectives you have with these pieces, like as a business? And so like when you start with that orient and you start to, you know, sort of step into the problems your client is trying to solve, as opposed to starting out with, I am a solution, right? Like the first job is I understand your problem Mm -hmm. and how I can help. And sometimes it's, I can't. And so let's not do business together. You know, it's relatively rare if they've reached out, but you know, it should be something that you are mindful of. Like if you don't think you can deliver the value to the client, then, you know, no matter how much money you want, to me, it's like, Hippocratic oath, like, you know, do no harm. It's like, you probably shouldn't take the gig, yeah. <laughs> right? So you have to understand where, you know, hey, what are you trying to achieve? And then, okay, and get into some understanding of, hey, my work generally does this for clients. And, you know, I think to some extent, you got to try and make it mathematical. 
because I think that's like, you know, you got to bring some objectivity to this. And so what happens is, and this is where, you know, value-based pricing often starts to trend into kind of niche stuff, where you go ahead and you develop some expertise in a niche and a deep domain knowledge, as opposed to being a generalist where I'll write for 100 industries. I start to understand like, oh, these kinds of clients with these kinds of problems, I have, you know, prior knowledge I can build on to get better at better at solving these problems with more and more impact. So those are, are again, like, and then I can do a better job consulting, a better time, job understanding your problems, a better job, you know, playing back to you the issues that are in your industry, because I'm not new here. I've done it a few times before. And that starts to give, you know, sort of more and more credibility to whatever price tag you're going to hang on things. Yeah, the part, and I think this is, really does depend what kind of writing you're doing and what have you. But, you know, to me, this conversion consulting thing on websites, if you're doing web stuff, you know, and you go learn about, you know, persuasion and conversion architecture, maybe you're building a white paper, you know, a firm is going to go ahead and use to attract new leads or something like that. You know, you can go and like, there's a whole discipline around that and show how your content's better than whatever their team wrote before. Like, I'm going to upgrade your content. And, you know, this is the performance you should expect from that because, you know, I've done it before for these other clients. And I think that's where things can get very powerful online. Offline may be a little harder because the measurement is just less obvious there. But anyhow, that might be a bit of a ramble, Ed. Rein me in. But, no, uh, no, no, no. That's, know, that's, that's, that's uh, good. So I'll throw a couple things at you, see if you agree or disagree. Feel free to yeah. be honest. I have found that in many cases, so a lot of my listeners are writing content and you mentioned one of them. So white papers, case studies, long form content, like longer articles and so forth that help sell at some point a complex product or service that also happens to be expensive, like, you know, medical equipment, for instance, uh, or an enterprise software system. And I found that having a discussion about what this could eventually impact, so in other words, two or three steps down the line, puts it in perspective. So we all know that it's going to be hard to quantify some of those things, but when the product service or solution in question is, you know, $750,000 on average, then we know that getting this piece right is important. So I've found that to be effective sometimes, even when we can't quantify it exactly, right? Does that make sense? Sure, yeah. And I think that the thing that, you know, is most impactful there for me and that I would double down on is, is trying to understand those two, three or four steps down the line. Like, yeah. don't do the job, understand the job, right? And then execute. Yeah, uh, And so take the time to go ahead and get your head around, where does this fit in all the stuff that you're doing, right? Like, how do I understand my place? And that'll also start to open up other opportunities for you. But if you just go in and say, hey, I need a piece on this medical device or what have you, I think your, you know, your understanding of the context in which your deliverable lives is you know, too narrow. Yeah, I agree. I agree. The other thing, I'll speak to something you mentioned a little earlier, which is domain expertise. So when you niche down, when you know that industry or topic really, really well, and you can demonstrate that, talking about yourself as the lower risk option, you know, because when Mm. they work with you on this, (laughs) the risk of this going well or going wrong, sure. The the probability is is much higher (laughs) of it going well, right? right? So I found that that combination tends to work well when it's very difficult to measure, but I like your point about really digging deeper and understanding that and explaining and showing the client that you do get it, right? Because they need to be sold. Do you find that there are some clients and prospects that just aren't going to get it, right? So you could be very well prepared. You could, you know, position yourself this way, but, you know, some people just aren't, uh, they're looking for the lowest cost resource. Yeah, whether it's lowest cost or they just, you know, they think they're dealing with like, you know, sort of consulting mumbo jumbo. I had one, you know, client who I did a bunch of work with or a prospective client. And he was like, here, my big concern right now is, you know, I do all this work and tell me, you know, what time my watch says, right? And this guy's a very successful entrepreneur. And he was just mm-hmm. kind of dubious. Like to me, he like, you know, I think we could have three or four X his multi-million dollar online sales. <laughs> so he, he <laughs> but you know, he was, uh, you know, suspicious and, you know, that's whatever. He's got street instincts as an entrepreneur and it was going to be hard to convince him. You know, that's fine. You know, like I think, sure. I think, like any client or what have you, you gotta, you know, you may run into an element of closed mindedness. That's not how it's done here or what have you. And, you know, to my mind, I think there's a couple thoughts there. One is, you know, be you. You know, like I wouldn't necessarily say you wanna change your spots. You know, maybe you wanna go ahead and say, okay, good. You know, thanks. We spent the time. I'm not gonna get this deal. Mm -hmm. Right. And those people will sometimes come back to you. 
because they'll go out and they'll realize, you know, we did speak with some other people and whatever, and you actually demonstrated you understood my space and my knowledge, right? You know, I didn't get that with the other people. And so we did some work with them, but, you know, it's up for reevaluation. And I remember speaking with you and now I want to buy. So playing the long game there, I think is a thing. And then, you know, also I'll just say, I don't judge anybody if, you know, if sometimes it's like, hey, I just got to make it work. And, you know, I'm going to do this one like this. But I would encourage that to be the exception, not the rule. You want to be progressing. I find, you know, client service work is kind of three phases. It's, you, know, you get started and you'll take any client you can get. And then you get a whole bunch of clients built up and then you're like, I have too many clients, right? That's the second phase. Mm -hmm. And then the third phase is I just get more and more selective. And so if you bump into somebody who doesn't want to work this way, you know, I think it really depends what phase in that progress you're in, right? A, like, you know, try to be you, you know, do work on selling the value. But if you're in a phase where I just need clients no matter what, you know, maybe you're going to take a project that you're like, Ugh, not the ideal, but I got to do it. And I'm not going to be sit here and judge anybody. But I think you want to get to the place where you're choosing your clients. And, you know, I think if you go and pitch somebody and they're just like, you know, I don't believe it's like, okay, this is what I am. I'm going to walk. I'll take my time and effort and focus and apply it to a relationship that I think will go for from this point on. And, you know, I think that's the orientation to have. I think that's a sound advice. I'm curious what your thoughts on what's happening in the world right now and how freelancers can bump up their confidently raise their fees and start moving in this direction when maybe they're very fearful because of, you know, the, the condition that the world is in right now. Yeah. Got a couple of thoughts. So yes, we have the kind of backdrop of COVID right now. I think there's a couple of thoughts. There's kind of raising your rates and then there's value-based, you know, pricing. Then I would almost try to divorce the two because rates sounds like hourly billing to me and raising rates and value pricing to me is, hey, I understand the client's needs. I bring them one price to solve a series of problems. And that price should be, you know, it should look really economical mm -hmm. <laughs> relative to you I'm, I'm delivering and that we have agreed on to solve the problem. And so I think the way I would orient things is the posture on like, hey, where and how do you deliver value? You know, I always like to try to get to something monetary, but I think you touched on something that is super valuable right now to people is, you know, there is kind of straight up cost that is a value factor, but there's also confidence. Right. And it's like if you can deliver this offering with less risk than the next person, even mm -hmm. if it costs a little more, it's like you don't want to rework it. You want to know it's going to work. And those are my children, by the way. Or hey, this is yeah. a, a lockdown <laughs> in COVID world. Anything goes. Yeah. <laughs> don't worry. So I guess it's like, hey, I would think like the stance and what you emphasize, you know, in a pre COVID world economy booming, it's all about growth. Mm -hmm. Right. Like one way you can offer value is actually, you know, to yeah, de-risk, right? You know, bring, I mean, I think one of the things I love about value-based is it's cost predictability. I will tell you in advance how much it's going to cost mm -hmm. as opposed to, and I think that's valuable now when people are worried about costs as opposed oh, yeah. to like, it's going to be hourly, right? And we'll see what it costs when it's done and that's how many scary. revisions you do. Yeah, it is, it is. So, so value-based says, no, let's put it up front. This is the cost to deliver the value. Anyhow, so I think that's that. And then as for the, you know, just the whole rates-based approach, again, I'm in a no-judging mode. These are unusual times. You know, I think there's a variety of things to go ahead and do to make sure that you are solvent today and also that you're building client relationships for the long term, right? So I think this is a great time to go ahead and get on the phone. And I think, you know, value-based is about, hey, there's a project, let me value for you. I, you know, if you're not already doing this in terms of building your business and keeping it alive right now, if you have clients, if you have not gotten on the phone and spoken with everyone with no agenda, just to understand their world, you know, what they're going through, what the new problems are that are emerging you know, in, for them, and perhaps even uncovering ways you can help them. And they might be not exactly the ways you used to help before or how you would think of your services, but like here are some opportunities where, oh, I can probably help you with that. And yes, I can probably charge you for it and or we'll figure out some solid some way I can contribute. So when things get back to good, like you're thinking of me, our relationship is deeper. And I'm going to actually earn more by virtue of our relationship. Those are a few of the things I would be thinking about in terms of you know building a successful practice in these circumstances. I love that mindset. I think it's very valuable advice, Mike. We touched on the topic of confidence. And I'm curious if you could maybe share some suggestions or ideas about mustering the confidence you need 
to start moving in this direction. I think for a lot of people, it seems like such a huge chasm, you know? So, and I get it. If it feels that way, you're not going to move in that direction. But how can you start taking these baby steps? Because I think with those steps come results, with the results come the confidence. So how do we start moving there? It's good. It's good. So, you know, so let me just go to, I think at the heart of all this is mindset. Okay. I really am a just strongly believe it's like mindset and orientation. And so, you know, a couple thoughts there. One, go ahead and read Breaking the Time Barrier because it'll help you with mindset. Okay. But mm-hmm. another thing I like to think about, and this is going to sound really unusual to people, but when I'm like really spooked about stuff or the future or where we're going, and like I run a pretty good size operation right now, you know, at various points on the journey, we've had one risk or another. You know, what I like to do is go ahead and imagine myself, you know, having totally failed, right? I go ahead and I project into the future and I picture it going all wrong and all my worst fears coming true. And then I realize I survived. I'm still (laughs) here. Right. And so I try to get over all that bad stuff before I begin. And then I go back to, okay, well, where are we? Okay, good. Well, I know it's not the end of the world. (laughs) Yeah. Because I've already lived it in my head and in my heart. And so, you know, so then I still see this other opportunity in this path. That's the downside. You know, if it happens, it happens. But let me get going on this other thing. And so I think I find that to be just a personal, you know, device that is helps me just kind of get when I'm stuck, a little bit unstuck. I think some of this training and education, something like breaking the time barrier is super helpful. But I also just think you have to be open to experimentation and you have to be able to try things. And if you're going to beat yourself up because you lose one client or three clients in the process of getting to the next level, if you will, I think it's okay to let go of those one or two or three clients, you know, get to, you know, a better group that, you know, on the whole, you're making 30% more on each one because you got to another level. And by the way, you like your life better. You know, it's not easy to progress, right? It's painful. And that's exactly what this is. And so, you know, growth, it's, you know, like... (laughs) We have a belief at FreshBooks that, you know, uh, business growth is personal growth, right? And so, you know, like it is probably, you got to understand, hey, it's probably you holding things back. It's not the circumstances. It's not anything else. It's probably you and your mindset. By the way, don't be upset by that because the truth of that statement is it's also in your control. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that is an empowering thing. So if, if it's at my hands, how do I go ahead and recontort my internals? <laughs> to get over myself effectively. <laughs> I am the obstacle. <laughs> That's kind of the way to think about it. And so, you know, something like a breaking the time barrier is going to help you with that. You know, having a coach talking through, finding some peers, talking through what have you found, you know, like, and just being open to kind of making some missteps. I think those are some of the things. I had one other really useful thing that I just, I can't find in my brain right now because I got on all those ones. But I think uh, <laughs> no, you know, that's, that's good. all relatively good stuff to kind of help you get to the other side of it. I agree that so much of it, it starts with mindset, but you can't replace taking those first steps, as scary as they might be, right? Because the, the initial results might be very scary. And it might seem negative, but you're going to find yourself in a better place. Then you're going to be glad that you took those risks and you did what you had to do. So I also think you just got to like, progress is kind of painful. Right? It it's, just, it's it messy. Is. It's messy. You know, yeah, it's absolutely messy. It's not a straight line. You know, the, the picture of like success is up into the right, except it's a big squiggly all over the place line. That's, that's exactly what it is, exactly how it feels. And just, I would just encourage you to try and enjoy the journey, including those down parts, because you'll get through them. I really believe in you. You will. Yeah. You will absolutely get through them, even if it feels like today you won't. That's probably that, you know, you're probably on the path. You know, we can chart the growth of fresh books over the years. What we don't see is all the stuff that was happening in the background, right? So that was messy. That is not that exponential growth curve. That was all over the place. Mike, this has been wonderful. I really opened my eyes to some new things that I hadn't really thought about. I, I know our listeners got a lot out of it. You mentioned the free trial. You know, is this really like a free trial? Like, can I really go in there and start using it and start invoicing uh, customers if I, if I sign up for it? Yeah, 100%. You go connect your bank account, get your records. Like, again, this is back to like, if you're using Google Docs and Word and Excel, you know, by the way, in that free trial account, and you can go ahead and like, we'll automate late payment reminders when your clients don't pay. And by the way, trust me, it's better when we send that email, you can draft it. So it's to your liking and tone and details and everything like that. But it gets responses that you wouldn't expect. So yeah, you can go in, sign up, create an invoice, track some expenses. 
you know, when you do those things, you get reporting for free. So tax time's all set. Oh, that's um, awesome. There's just, there's just all kinds of things. There's time tracking in there for those of you who, hey, while I'm always selling value billing, you know, it's not a terrible idea to track your hours so you know where your time is going yourself, even if you never expose it to a client. Yeah, right? it's an so, internal thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so that's good. So you've made it really fair and really useful. It's not one of these really skimpy trials. Where can people sign up for the trial? Yeah, at freshworks.com. Okay, easy. Awesome. Well, Mike, thanks again for coming on today, man. I really appreciate all your insights. Yeah, good to catch up, Ed. Thanks for having me. The High Income Business Writing Podcast is a production of B2B Business Launcher. Learn more at b2blauncher.com.